Ron Sims has had many titles in his career. His current title is, uh, includes, or one of his current titles is uh, Chair of the Board of the Washington Health Benefit Exchange. It has included Deputy Secretary for Housing and Urban Development, uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, has included King County Executive, Candidate for Governor, King County Council Member, uh, Minister, Father, Husband, and any number of things. And one thing, I think one title he has, uh, has uh, uh, never never sort of discharged is sort of that as of motivator. And so it, it is interesting to watch him deal with uh, a political board, a contentious board at times, a challenging relationship uh, on occasion between an agency that is quasi-independent, i.e. the exchange, uh, and uh, the rest of Washington state government, the legislature, the governor's office, an independent uh, regulator in the insurance commissioner. It's a tremendously complex task. and. Uh, I, I think he's uh, one of few who can handle the job. So with that, I'd, I'd like to invite to the stage the Honorable Mr. Ron Sims. Well, it's an honor to be here at this conference. And I was looking at all the materials you've had to read, all the speakers that you have, all the sessions you're having, and it just seems so Washington, where all of a sudden I believe that this state, after my years and a couple of years in the federal government, I always thought there was one state, one state that was the change agent for the country, and I still believe the state of Washington is that change agent. And this conference is unusual because of the array of issues that you're working on. But let me kind of talk to you about healthcare generally, and uh, it's good to be back in Spokane where I grew up. But uh, let me talk to you about healthcare generally and how I, what I think about the HBE. Let me kind of give you how I got involved there, because it was, I'll, I'll give you two stories. When I was uh, the county executive, uh, we got a call at my office, and they said, this is the Presidential Transition Committee, and we'd like to talk to Mr. Sims. And so uh, my staff came over and said, the Presidential Transition Committee's on. And I said, no, that's some reporter wondering whether I'm going to run for a fourth term, and they want to record me looking for another job. So they gave me the phone, and I hung up. Then the call came in again, and the person said, this is the Presidential Transition Committee. My staff said, no, no, really, it's the, it's the, and I said, no, give them to security. So I gave them to, gave to my security staff, and they came back and said, no, this actually is the Presidential Transition Committee. So I said, oh, okay. So I'm on the phone for about 35 minutes, and I, I had been elected for three terms. And so my goal was to finally tell them who they should hire of the people I knew and met who could actually understand the issues of governance, the issues of West Coast, the issues of large jurisdictions, the complexity that we faced. So we had a, a receptive ear in Washington, D.C. So it's about a 40 minute call and a person says to us, oh, okay, fine, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate this. And then I get another call and uh, my staff get it, not me. And they say, could Mr. Sims come back and could he brief the Presidential Transition Committee on you know, the issues that he talked about on the phone? So my staff created a briefing book about this big. I remember reading that book for weeks. I, I said, I didn't want to sound stupid. I just wanted to make my point. So it was a feeling I was uh, cramming for my finals. So I read it, and I read it, and I read it. And then they condensed it into a book about this stick on the plane. I remember I had a, the, the person didn't believe it was in a backpack, so I had to pull it out of the backpack to say, this is a briefing book, and the person going through to make sure it was just that so I can get on the plane. And uh, so I went to the federal building and I, you, you know, you go through security, uh, so in Chicago, and you go up to the 31st floor and I walk up and I said, hi, I, I am uh, King County Executive Ron Sims and I'm here to uh, brief staff uh, on um, um, some issues. And they said, oh yes, yes, we're expected, thank you very much, Mr. Sims. Why don't you go in that room? So I go in this room and I'm sitting there and I'm reading my briefing book. And who comes in? President-elect Obama. Now, I'm going, he says, oh, come with me. And so my, I said, oh, wow, this is Star Chamber. So I'm walking with him. I was starstruck. Yes, I was. I mean, you know, here's your, I was starstruck. So I'm walking and I'm looking around. I'm going, this is going to be interesting. He's going to have all these people quiz me. And so I, he 
I go into this room and I don't see anybody, just him. And he says, have a seat. But I don't know which one is his. <laughs> so I make no commitment. And he walks a little further, turns around and says, no, 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 sit anywhere. So I move and still make no commitment. And then he says, he laughs again, and he says, sit anywhere, I promise you, I will not sit in your lap. So I sit down. So he sits next to me for about, and we have a talk, so it's almost an hour, and he says to me, um, I hear you want a job in my, in my administration. I said, no, Mr. President, I'm, I'm going to run for a fourth term. It's county executive, he says. But if I ask you to work for me, what would you say? I said, I don't know, Mr. President. Has anybody told you no? He says, I don't know. Has anyone told me no? <laughs> so I, I got out of the meeting and called my wife and said, I, I think I just made a transition to another career. The, uh, she says, oh, good. I was expecting that. I was so, you know, so, the, uh, so that's how I felt when, when the governor called me early in the morning. Right, I'm pleasantly sitting down, I'm having a, you know, a cup of coffee, I'm at my computer, doing my Facebook, answering emails, um, just generally in my PJs looking really morningish. And I got a call saying, the governor would like to talk to you. And I said, oh, that's fine. Here, you know, are you going to be there long? I was going to go, no. Oh. So then he calls and he said, I would like for you to be the chair of the Health Benefit Exchange. So he goes on and on and on and on. And I said, Governor, can I tell you something? And he said, what? I said, well, first, I thought you liked me. <laughs> and, and secondly, I thought we were on good terms. He said, well, are you yes or no? I said, oh, yes. So it has been a wonderful learning experience for me. I knew a lot about health care, but the acronyms surrounding the Health Benefit Exchange and what plans and programs they are, and I have vowed in my retirement that I refuse to learn one new additional acronym. I mean, Washington, D.C. is acronym capital, and you master them, otherwise you cannot navigate through buildings and through programs. But I think that what I have sometimes in healthcare, I think it's competitive with what my experiences are. But if somebody were to ask me what I really want to see the HBE do, one, it's the most successful launch in the United States. Last, we had 10 issuers, 90 different plans, two uh, uh, regional plans. We are envied. People want to know how you did it, and I said, well, if you drink our water and live in our area, you understand why Washington does what Washington does. It's going to be done incredibly well. Have there been challenges? As I tell people, you name a rollout that has gone perfectly, please tell me when it happened, because it hasn't happened on any of my computer software. It hasn't done been anybody who's been really major and significant has not rolled it out perfectly. And in fact, you're always going to have those. But nonetheless, it is a testament both to the state's commitment, Republicans and Democrats in the legislature, a, a, a governor's commitment, the business community, the plans, and everybody to make something work incredibly well, to do something that's really, really important. When I grew up in Spokane, my oldest brother James had serious asthma uh, and emphysema, a, a combination. And one day my parents went to the grocery store and my brother collapsed. And I was seven years old. And all I knew is you're supposed to call zero and ask for an ambulance. So I called zero and the ambulance came and they took my brother to the hospital. And I remember my twin brother, I said, Donnie, what are we supposed to do next? Because nobody told us what was going to happen next. And so the, um, uh, my parents came home. I said, I said, James collapsed. I was crying. James collapsed. James collapsed. He's at the hospital. So my mom and dad say, OK. My father says, Letty, you stay here. I'll go to the hospital. My mother says, no, James, you stay here. I'll go to the hospital. My neighbor comes over, so our neighborhood, my neighbor babysits us, and my parents go to the hospital. My parents come back and say to me, your brother's going to move. His doctor was Dr. Steer, who I will thank for the end of my days. And Dr. Steer had, made, had been treating my brother's asthma for all these years. And he made a decision that my brother needed to go to the National Jewish Hospital in Denver, Colorado, where my brother lived for six years. Now, I would like to thank everybody who supported that hospital, because it was by contributions. And yet my brother went from a very compromised, very weak, and very susceptible to coming back and lived for another 
58 years. I had a big brother for 58 years because we had health care. And I've always been committed to the fact that my brother and our family was no different than any other family. Everybody is entitled to health care. When I got older and I was debating whether I was going to be in politics or go to divinity school, I, I decided I would volunteer at Harborview Hospital for two years. And you would see everybody come in. It's a trauma one center, so you saw the insured come into the hospital. And you realize that it was also a hospital for people who were very poor. You'd go to the burn center. You had a whole array of challenges as a volunteer. And I wanted to pour my heart and soul in it, so I spent two days a week, but you worked long hours into the evening in that hospital for two years, debating whether I was going to be a chaplain or not. But you cannot leave a hospital like that and not believe in people's access to health care. You cannot. Any age, any race, any language. So I'm both proud of this country that we have an Affordable Care Act, and I am unbelievably believably proud of this state whose plans and whose public officials embrace the fact that people are entitled to health care. It is important. It's our well-being. It creates the James Simses of the world who get a doctor steer in their life. Or in my case, Dr. White, who happened to be a woman. And I will never forget, I thought everybody had a, a woman as a doctor. I never realized that women weren't doctors until I, I got older. People said, you had a woman doctor? How was that? I thought it was great. I, I thought everybody had you know, a Dr. White in their life. Healthcare is not just a piece. It is not just something we do. It is something that molds and shapes our values and our cultures. So I want to talk about the HBE, which is somebody said to me, what would you do if you ruled the world? HBE is only a part. It is basically just the, the engineering. That's all we are, a portal site that offers variety of plans for people to make decisions on. But I told my wife, I said, you know what really frustrates me? I want a superb plan that provides access and that everybody participates in so they will have health insurance for their well-being and for their confidence and for their family and for their loved ones, that they will have health insurance, that it will not be something that rolls on them with a big bill, that they will not feel helpless or hopeless or overwhelmed that they will have it, but it pays for people who are sick. And so it can only be a piece. It is not the answer. Healthcare is a lot of things. Healthcare is the fact that I believe in wellness. I remember in King County, when I was a county executive, we were looking at how should we pay for increased healthcare costs. And so I had a rule in my, with my staff, which is if you took a risk, and you succeeded, I would sing your praises to the end of the world. If you took a risk and failed, I would applaud you to the end of the world. If you took no risk at all, I'd make it a really bad work day for you. So I remember looking at this chart and somebody saying to me, you're going to have to, you know, we were looking at premium share. And this young man named Jim Lopez got up and said to me, that doesn't work. Now the rule was, you could say that to me, you had two weeks to make a correction or provide an alternative. That was, now it was just an odd, I never enforced it. I mean, you know, I was so used to being told that I wasn't very bright, it was okay. The public was doing that all the time. So it was just, you know, he said that. And I said, okay, Jim, give me a proposal in two weeks. So he comes back and he says, why don't we pay for people to be well? Why don't we? He says, well, you're always paying for people to be sick, but wellness saves money, not sickness. And I remember saying, so how should that be conceived? So we brought 22 people in. We sent 22 letters out to people who dealt, dealt with these issues. And this state had a lot of people, a lot of people, who were healthcare experts known internationally. So we sent these letters out. I expected two people to answer, and all 22 did. It was the first time they could gather and talk to each other about their respective work. So in the first meeting, I was trying to chime in about what my agenda was, and they were all getting to know each other. So the meeting wasn't very productive, but the next meetings were. And they said to us, we have made it, we will do for you what we have not been able to do elsewhere, which is how do you get people well? And so they came out with a wellness strategy. We incentivized people being well. We said, yes, you have insurance. That's always going to be important. 
but wellness was really important. And it, I smile to this day because if I could do anything, I would love some plans to go through the health benefit exchange with wellness options. I would be happier. I would be so happy. I would entertain everybody. I'd have cake. I'd have bands. I'd have flowers because there has to be some place where somebody comes out and says, wellness counts. Wellness is important. What has wellness done in King County? It's done a number of things. One, they've got an incredible staff in King County. Many of you, some of them were here today, an incredible staff. But well, what did wellness do? Wellness lowered, I can, I'll never forget, we required as a matter of policy that both adults in the household, no matter what the, what the, whatever the relationship was, had to go through a survey or a review of your health behaviors. And I remember telling my wife, well, that was thorough. And my wife said, that was really invasive. However, we turned it in. Now, my wife went to not having to do, just keep her habits of exercise and diet. And I was advised that I needed to have a coach because I had to be seven foot two not to be morbidly obese. And I remember my wife just gloating over, you know, <laughs> wow, it's going to be a change in this house. And uh, I remember the coach telling me, you know, Mr. Sims, you have challenges, but we'll get there. I also remember as over the course of this that we made a decision that 80% of our costs were catastrophic illnesses. And so we could identify those earlier. So what did you do with the What we did is we decided to incentivize people doing age group tests so that we have early identification of any you know, carcinoma or other issues that might affect you. And I remember I came back after taking a test I did not want, having a procedure I did not want. I did not want it. They said, you gotta go take it. I said, no, I don't wanna take it. My doctor said, you gotta take this. I said, I don't wanna take it. So I remember sitting down with my staff and they said, Mr. Sims, we would like to tell everybody in the county that you have a colonoscopy. <laughs> No, no, and he said, because people don't take them and they're critical. And this may mean a difference. I said, you want me to announce my colonoscopy? No, it will not happen. So all of a sudden we informed 23,000 people in King County that I had one, but it actually ticked up the number of people that went to the procedures. Wellness. So if I ruled the world, if I could change something, I would say, yes, give me all those options. We have more options in King County, excuse me, in the state of Washington, more options for health care than most states. I mean, they're envious. They're going, whoa, how'd you do that? I said, commitment. People were committed to providing levels of health care. They wanted people insured. We didn't have to go through the political agony that some states do. We don't have people out there campaigning against it. We had people who understood that there was a consequence of not having it. So having it was more important. Some people say it was a moral issue. Some say it was a political issue. Some say it was a business issue. I don't care how they got there. The fact is that they did. And so we have had a robust, very robust participation in it. And it's only going to grow. But there are other things that I would like to see done in healthcare. So I talk about the issue of insurance. But let me tell you some other things. We can predict with incredible accuracy health outcomes by any zip code in the United States of America. We did it in King County. And uh, people say, oh, no, 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 How, you can't predict health outcomes by zip code. You can't predict lifetime earnings by zip code. We said, oh, yeah, we actually can. And we had a really, really good tool to do that. And PBS came and took our tool and went down to Modesto, California, and came back and said, in a series they did, that King County's tool was incredibly accurate. So I went back to Washington, D.C. I was known as a guy who was going to make zip codes an address, never again a life determinant. I remember working with the CDC, who has incredible staff, and you met some today, just unbelievable, where we were talking about the issues of the built environment and how determinative the built environment is. So I want to say we can talk about insurance, and we can talk about wellness, but we will never overcome who gets sick and who doesn't until we make decisions at making neighborhoods where you're likely to get sick better because they can be. So if it, what's a neighborhood that looks sick look like? 
I can tell you what it looks like. It looks like 98118, which is right next to mine, 98144. And 98144, where I am, and you're an African-American male, you're likely to be able to live pretty well until you're about 82, 83. Even that, in a neighborhood right next to mine, the zip code right next to mine, four blocks away from my neighborhood, what will happen to you? You'll live to probably 65 to 67. You will have diabetes, heart disease. You will have an amputation, never a pill. So the difference is, What's in my neighborhood is not in their neighborhood. I have parks, we have trails, we have wide sidewalks, we have well-lit streets, we have community gardens. We have every sin single signal you need. And I remember the Justice Department came to me when I was in Washington, D.C., and they said to us, you know, Mr. Sims, we heard you give a speech on zip codes, and so we actually did a study on it. And you know what we found out? Crime rate, you take it, African Americans or Latinos or Asians in a neighborhood in LA that looks like this versus a neighborhood that looks like this. The same people, same family makeup, same income, in a neighborhood that is green, crime rate is 70% less than the crime rate in neighborhoods that are concrete. How would you explain that? I said, oh, oh well, as in the species, we evolved in the grasslands, not in canyons. And they went, what? I said, well, you asked me a question. Yeah, we evolved in grasslands. The cultures of the human, humans were grasslands people. And I said, but it's got to be more than that. And I understand that. I don't want to get into a philosophical issue about creation and all that. I just want to know that grasslands work. So the, uh, they couldn't do that. They couldn't put out a grant saying that either. So they didn't. But, they, but the interesting thing is that we found a significant statistical differentiation. So I would tell people that, and I was giving a speech in Atlanta, Georgia, and I said to the municipal, all the cities, and I said, you know, hold a second. It's inexcusable if you're going to ask health insurance and health providers to keep a nation healthy. They're there to treat. But in the end, we need something that keeps people well. It's wellness programs, but it is how you design your cities and your neighborhoods. Everybody should have a park and a trail and wide sidewalks. I was in Los Angeles and the mayor said to me, we're, we were waiting for the vice president and they're always late. So we were sitting in a, in a, in a, on, on the steps in, a, in an older building and finding out that we actually had a lot in common, both in terms of our life's experiences and, and family systems. And so he uh, said to me, you know, Mr. Sims, we can't get elderly African-Americans to walk anymore in neighborhoods where we have a lot of Latinos. And I say, he says, so how would you fix that? I said, I'd cut away the corners of buildings. He said, what? I'd round out the buildings. There are no 90 degree corners in nature. And I said, so if I would you, I, can they see through the building the other side? He says, why? Because you are worried about what you don't see when you walk, and all of us are. So he cuts away the, he finds, a street where he can do that, and he says, oh, he calls me on the phone, oh, God, you were right. I got some people just to adjust their corners. They were supermarkets, and they put some windows in that we helped pay for so you can see the other side of the building. We rounded out one corner. We bulbed a sidewalk. All that really worked. Not only did the African-American elderly start walking, the Latino elderly started walking. I said, everybody likes a safe street. Safety is important. It's really important. And if you want people to walk, you put them on safe streets. Some streets can be wider. All of them need to be well lit. But people will walk in a safe environment. Is that important? The answer is absolutely yes, because I can tell you all the medicine in the world won't keep you healthy. Exercise works. My mother-in-law, who's 91, lives with us. And she was complaining. She was complaining. She says, I want a wheelchair. And she went on and on. This had to be a three-month campaign for a wheelchair. Now, so finally, we took her to the doctor, my wife did, to meet with the physical therapist in order to get a wheelchair. And so the, uh, the doctor is walking with my mother-in-law and my wife and says to my mother-in-law, you're walking, why do you need a wheelchair? I don't need a, wall I don't need a wheelchair. Well, she looks at my wife. My wife says, my wife's kind of rolling her eyes like, yes, I'm here only because she wants it. So she says to my mother-in-law, come back when you need it. But you don't need to be in a wheelchair. You are walking just fine. So what did I do with my mother-in-law? 
My mother-in-law walks all over the place now. She walks from upstairs, downstairs. She walks, you know, I mean, she is walking all over the place. And she says, I told you I could walk. I told you I could walk. Now, it's a great transformation, and I love it. But we know that walking helps even when you're 91. Keeps you alert and healthy. So what I want to say is that health care is here. But we need to break a lot of silos. And one of them is how we build out our cities and our neighborhoods. It's really important. It is incredibly important. It, you can't do that on your own. We can have as many conferences as we want, but if we don't fundamentally change design, if we don't take a healthcare message and say, it's not just us, it is you public officials and you zoning planners and you builders that are also determining health outcomes in America. Zoning does. If you're in, 90, in my neighborhood of Rainier Avenue, there is a fast, we call it neon signs, every single block. If you're in a wealthy neighborhood, they don't have neon signs because people don't like them. The issue is to treat every neighborhood the same. If you don't want fast foods, they shouldn't zone them for one community and not, vote, and not others. You should never have fast foods across from schools. If you want to, you can't tell kids to eat healthy and then say, walk, walk across the street a block and you can have every fast food you want because you create a fast food behavior. It gets adopted and it's really hard to break. So part of your task, and I know, is to look at the, the world of health care in terms of illness and insurance and in part wellness, but community design is also incredibly important to examine. There's other things. I remember trying to, I was, I had to go to a, I sat on the board of the Pacific Northwest Diabetes Institute and I got invited to hear the, the, the uh, it, was a, it was a great speech. It was done by the science advisor to the um, prime minister of New Zealand. And so he is talking about all of his research with the World, 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 World Health Organization. And he says, so let's talk a little bit about an infant born by a starving mother. What kind of cells is it born with? I was a layperson. I said, I don't know the same cells every kid's born with. I mean, I had, you know, cells were cells. And he says, so, no. I mean, I think he was looking at me thinking, okay, there was one person who acknowledged he was stupid. Is there anybody else in this audience that wants to do that? So he said, no. Babies born of starving mothers have what we would call in this country bad cells, bad fat cells. They store fat. The baby does not wish to starve. It becomes a storage unit. And it's grown with, and that's what it's born with, which struck me as an interesting thing. He says, but genetically, it's going to happen. With any starving mother is going to have a baby, it's going to have a lot of those fat cells. They need storage. They want to survive, too. And he says, so he's a person who had some girth, not obnoxious, but, you know, he, you know, he had a waistline. And he again looks at me, at my waistline, and he says, you know, there are people in America, and you guys are really weight conscious. You gain weight and you lose weight and you gain weight and, and he's all the time he's looking right at me. Gain, lose, gain, lose, gain, lose. And I wanted to say, how did you know? How did you know? And then he says, so you know what happens each time you gain weight back? You gain a higher percentage of bad fat cells back. You just simply accumulate more of them because your body thinks it's starving. It's never lost that habit. So you starve it. It brings back more of those bad fat cells at a greater percentage. He says, we call it the yo-yo effect. We've been studying that for a long time, which is how we began to look at starving children. I said, oh, well, it's really great. Fat, raw, and starving children. But nonetheless, we know that happens. In healthcare, it's really, really important for us then to understand something called epigenetics. In my speech in Georgia, I said, no one ever gave you permission to manipulate someone's genes. No one did. Our genes are not constant. They change and make adjustments. Even our DNA now, we know molecularly, is not what we call solid state. We used to say, you're born with it. No, no, we can't make that argument anymore. And you heard the speaker allude to it this morning at the lunch hour. No one gave us permission to manipulate. And the issue for us then is to figure out how, if in fact genes can be altered, then how do you create a healthy environment in your home, in your neighborhood, in your schools, and in your employers. And it can be done. And somebody says it's manipulative, it's so big brotherish, and the answer is no. It is simply what we call healthy signals. And we know they work incredibly well.
So we get kids who go to school. And we have this big push now for kids to in the early preschool, early preschool education. I believe in that. The issue, though, is why some kids learn and some kids don't. And we have, they have stressors, and we see those stressors. But you can't learn under stress. You simply get the same information and you process it differently. Your brain does and your body does when it's under stress. If you want those schools to work, and we're making a huge national policy, the issue is to articulate how to change the environment they work in. People say it's family. We said, no, it's the built living environment they live in. Do they have toxics in the home? Is there still lead paint? People say it's all gone. No, lead paint's never gone. Some of it's radon. We don't have radon problems in the Pacific Northwest. But we do have a fungus problem in the Northwest, which has very significant impacts. Are you near what we call major transportation centers? We call it emitters. Because we know in vitro, when we have a lot of emissions from cars and trucks, and people live, know, we know that it shows up in vitro. We know it does. So our key is to be smart and create an environment in which we can grow up and we can live in that actually is a healthy environment. And it doesn't mean that our work is wasted. I look at you and say, if anybody can pull it off, you in this room can. Because you are the ones that know that there is no silo in healthcare. You, you know, you can say that pretty easily and people will actually trust what you said. There are no silos in health. Our issue is how to organize them, how to gather them, how to pull them together, and how to make them meaningful in the most competitive time in our country's history and the most competitive time in humankind's history. I believe you can do that. And I believe that it must be done. Healthcare is that one catalytic thing. We'll always wait for it. We had the age of technology and Bill Gates coming from the mountains of New Mexico with his long beard and long hair, along with his other core group of six people, decided everybody was going to listen to you know, use computers. And people said, what? And when his father convinced him to go sell stock, it sold at 10 bucks. And there weren't many shares, and he had to get loans. Now, nobody ever looked at Bill Gates and his long hair and a dropout from Harvard University or Paul Allen from his fraternity life at Washington State University, go Cougs. Nobody ever looked at them and said these people were going to be determiners of a new era, and yet they became that. Healthcare is now that one catalytic issue in this country that has commonality, and where being innovative and imaginative can be pretty extraordinary in regards to its approach. I grew up in Spokane, and uh, Last time I was here, I walked to my parents' house, 1218 East 5th Avenue, Spokane, Washington, 99202, area code 509-535-3601. It's not far from here. And I walked down past Lewis and Clark High School, the only school called LC, and everybody knows where it is. Past Grant School, Old Lincoln School, down by the Grant Street neighborhood, to my parents' house in Liberty Park. It was really interesting because I had a lot, number of mixed emotions. There were several things. One, I said to myself, wow, you know, I grew up here. So I got down to the house and I was looking for my brother's old beat up Renault Dauphine. And I looked for my other brother's, my mother's Nash. She had a Nash. And I looked for my other brother's Chevrolet, 1954. So I just walked slowly by the house. My mom and dad didn't come out to welcome me. They always did. They always waved. And when we left, they always waved. And the picture window of the house was still there, but my parents were not in that picture window. My brothers will never drive a car again for the rest of this eternity. So I thought about the fact that I was the only one left from 1218 East. Fifth Avenue, the one with all the memories, the one that kind of knew what happened in the neighborhood, the one that's got to somehow organize that so there could be a story told to my nephews, my nieces, and to my sons, and to now my very perfect granddaughter and my very perfect grandson, of what it was like for the five of us in that house. A higher authority than anybody in this room determined that their work was done. 
but the one who was hit by a car, the one who fell out the car door on a highway in North Dakota, the one who held a hose up to a high tension line and watched it spark. I was excused because a higher authority said my job was not done. So I want to tell all of you in this room that a higher authority has said your job is not done. You've been given days, weeks, months, years, and careers. And the real question is how remarkable you wish to be. There is a world waiting for an integrated healthcare system that's beyond its silos, but does all of its work incredibly well. And we're gonna be a place of innovation and imagination. We're gonna spice up things. That people are gonna come here just to wanna see you, talk to you, and watch you. That people will be drawn to your energy and to your vision because they realize in the end, Jimmy, says, Jimmy Simses can grow up and be big brothers. Peace to you and thank you. Thank you, sir. You don't get to leave just yet. I want to see if you uh, have, uh, if there are any questions in the audience, uh, David or Stephanie, Senator Jan uh, Angel, or Angel, and uh, I, I would just say before we get into questions as the microphone's coming up there, uh, you never fail to disappoint in terms of putting things in perspective, so thank you for your, your comments here tonight. Thank you for your kind remarks. Yes, Senator, how are you? Thank you for being here. As the chair of the board of the exchange, can you give us an update as to where we are with our patients, insurers, and the exchange, the IT problems we're having? Um, can you I should know later today, that? but we sat down with Deloitte. We have two different groups now working on it. We have the, the programmers, uh, and they found a coding error, uh, so they have ID'd I, I finally the coding error. And we also have a group that is, we call the war room, where the plans, the HBE, are all in the same room, and we're, they're giving us data, and then we're updating. So pretty optimistic it's gonna get cleared up, but uh, the coding error, which I learned about yesterday, now has a whole nother group, uh, but they discovered it. According to the, the, the message I got this morning, which is really important, the, uh, nobody knew what it was, everybody was troubled by it, and it was simply, we had a, two coding errors, I w they will run the system again without those, with the coding errors that change, and we'll have a better idea about how quickly we can continue to close the gap. We're down a lot. We have gone through, we've had 18,000 accounts now adjusted, so that's fixed. We're now looking at uh, a remain, another about four to 5,000, trying to figure out who they are, have they paid, uh, do, did they get other jobs and move to other employers, and the coding errors should tell us what trend what happened to them. So I, we are, I think we are, and we have to be done because we have a, uh, we have a- New enrollment no, coming. <laughs> in, in November, uh, yeah. and as I said to them, please make me really, really happy. But I think we're gonna be really pleased with the results. But it's been a team effort, and I can't, I can't thank the plans who allocated a considerable number of staff, the uh, HBE staff, for both the war room and the tech work. I, the questions work. I'm getting from constituents are kind of wanting, are they going to be notified? Yes. That their problems are, okay. Yes, Great. they will, 18,000 have been notified, the remaining, and that's where we knew we had a coding error, is when people who we knew had problems from emails that came in had not heard from us. And the issue is, this don't leave them in the dark. Everybody yeah. will be, everybody who has had the experience of either going to a doctor or to a pharmacist and being told that they were not insured we'll get a notification of their status. Other questions? Uh, and I told them that they will, I will not go into legislative session until it's really, really fixed because having been an elected official for a long time, um, you listen to your constituents. I went on, I, I tell people, I say, why didn't you run again? I said, let me tell you a story about running. I said, I was at a restaurant with my wife anniversary. It was our anniversary. It was a wonderful anniversary. And then the waiter came over after we had signed the bill and stuff, and he said to me, I know this is your private time. Do you, do you have a minute? And uh, so I gave a minute, and my wife never had an anniversary dinner with me again at any place inside the city, uh, inside the state. But it was, uh, I said, we, 
we take all those comments seriously, and I don't want to go into the session having people say that my constituents were not well served and their needs were not addressed by us. So I'm hoping that you will be pleased when we go back into session. Any uh, others? Ron, if I might. Oh, Amina, over here. Hi there. Um, how would you, you know, last year for the open enrollment, obviously it was an enormous event. It was the rollout of, of the ACA, really. Um, and we saw just so much activity, huge PR campaigns, 250 events in King County alone. Uh, driven by an amazing navigator organization there, and really the navigators across the state. Yeah. Now, a year later, uh, there have been cutbacks in some of the in-person assisters that are funded. Um, some of the FQHCs that we work with aren't really focused on doing as many outreach events. And I think the overall budget in terms of PR and another kind of outreach is down. What do you think we're going to see this time around in the open enrollment period? Who's going to come out um, for the exchange, but also for, for the Medicaid side, kind of the um, people switching or, or just kind of uh, being tuned in to open enrollment, even though on Medicaid they can enroll anytime? And Milliman, which has been doing a lot of the surveying, said that, that we would probably get about 86,000 new enrollees. We've always exceeded that. So we have budgeted somewhere between you know, where we, what we would dream of and uh, Milliman's estimate. We have a percentage that we've always exceeded of theirs, so we're pretty optimistic. It's really interesting because the um, assisters and stuff are in the budget the same way they have always been. And so when people say that we've reduced their money, it always surprises me because that money has remained constant. It's not, it, it, we, but we give the money during the period when we're really being very aggressive, and then it declines, but it goes back up again right prior to, to enrollment again because they've been so effective for us. So that might be just a flux in terms of programming. You don't want to pay a person a constant amount. If you, you know, you want to, when you, when you had the open enrollment period, you put a lot of resources behind it to make it work very, very, very effectively. Um, and I was watching an email chain today and somebody pointed out, but we've already, we would do what we did last year, which is not try to hold them constant, but to say, here's where you start, and then you taper down, and you go back up again, so that we are a, a revenue system, so we get money when people enroll. And our idea is how do you continue to, to try to operate in a way that allows you uh, an infrastructure that is maintained, but you might size it up or down, as we do with the call center as well, based upon uh, what we have coming in and what our enrollments are. So, um, but we're still committed. I, I always tell people ground wars are really, really important. Um, um, you know, publicity is really, really important too. But the uh, sisters and people who got behind this last year, wow, they did an amazing, amazing job. We are targeted a little bit more on issues of language. For instance, uh, I was looking at Yakima County, and, and they said Spanish speaking. We've done. The, I said, what about people who speak Tagalog? And they said, uh, what's that? I said. My wife's from the Philippines, and they have a huge Filipino population in the valley, and they speak Tagalog. We need people to speak Tagalog. And I, I, they say, well, Chinese. And I said, well, you know, if you're in a neighborhood like mine, there's no such phrase as Chinese. You have Chinese from Hong Kong, and you have, you know, you have Cantonese, and you have Manchurian, and, and you have Vietnamese Chinese, which see themselves as Vietnamese Chinese, not Chinese, and you have Filipino Chinese, and our issue is how do we speak to those populations as well, because I think they have enrollment potential for us. And a prime example I use was Vietnamese uh, Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, uh, which is not on our list, but has been added for our list for uh, talking to those populations. We had, uh, when I was a county executive, we had asphyxiations taking place in homes with people who were Vietnamese burning charcoal in the home and being overwhelmed and they were dying. And so the Seattle Times did a remarkable job of putting on the front page all the languages, please don't burn charcoal. Did not affect Vietnamese at all. The numbers still went up. Then we went to the um, uh, merchants and said, we want to buy ads and stuff like that. And the merchants said to us, no, don't do that. We don't communicate that way. You go find the organizations that work with people, and you tell, and you get them out there knocking on doors. And the minute we did that, it just dived. And it was because the communication, knocking on the door, saying don't do something, was far more powerful than the Seattle Times, and far more powerful than an ad. And so I think on enrollment, it's the same way. 
Uh, one of the things that we're going to do in the budget, and I made it really clear, is it's going to be friendly. Um, it, it, you need to have the portal. People underestimate its power, but when you go to a portal, you want it to be easy to use, and you want information from it. Now, I've, I've been fascinated by technology. We've had, I, I, my wife was talking, today was the first time we haven't had anybody who's a guest in our house since March. Uh, two weeks ago, we had eight additional guests in the house, so I felt like a mini hostel, or however you want to, you know, the bread and breakfast, I don't know how you want to describe it, but they're consumers. And it's been interesting watching people's consumer habits. They shop. They actually shop. Uh, and they shop on price, and they shop on product, and then they'll say, okay, this is for sale, does anybody need it? Well, the answer is no, so they don't buy it. But sometimes they'll say, oh, well, I didn't know this was on sale, I was looking for it, and especially when you're gonna send gifts back to the Philippines, which is, you know, you, that's pretty constant is a, an issue. And I was thinking about that because our site doesn't give, you know, we've, we've had a lot of discussion on it, but I think that there's two things that really have to happen. You have to be able to select your doctor. You should be able to select, you, and we don't allow that. We don't have clinic search. We don't have doctor search on the, on the site as to what plans they're in. Uh, we don't have, um, which I think is going to be really, really important. We don't have, um, uh, some people are, are dependent upon a certain drug, so we don't access that either. So that's going to be a feature on the page. And the other, and I try to be delicate, I, uh, pr pricing is important. It's not just a cost calculator you want, but you should be able, I, I, I sit on the Washington Health Alliance board, I've been there for a long, long time, and they do remarkable work on two things. One, they rate doctors and hospitals, and everybody's conceded we should do that, on um, um, we call on care, on your levels, are you doing the care correctly? I think that should be public. I think that when you choose your doctor, you should be able to see how your doctor's rated in comparison to the state, the nation, and doctors in that locale as to the treatment of your illness. So you don't go to somebody out of habit, which is what I tend to do, you go to somebody who's effective. And the other one is to be able to look at price, which I think is really, really important. I, I watched my family for the last, especially the last three weeks, um, I mean, you can, whether it's groceries, groceries at the grocery store, is there a raisin sale, is there apple prices, oil, toothpaste, with books, records, baby bottoms, footwear, perfume, I mean, everything is priced. But the one thing that I always think is critical is I don't know the price of the care I get. And it just bothers me because I should be able to have that information. I just, you know, and, there, and I don't, you know, from the Alliance point of view, we don't often see a, a, the quality and price matching. And the issue is, should I pay more? And I'll give you an example. Aetna, when I was a county executive, let me look at their under, they have a database. And they said to me, Ron, they were very proud I got a colonoscopy. I have no idea, but I'm talking to their CEO and he's there. And we're sitting down and he says, where do you live? I said, you know, gave him my address and my zip code 98144. He says, well, let's see how many people in three miles of your house do colonoscopies. The price varied from $1,100 to $17,000. I said, $17,000? Who would go to a doc for 17000 He says, if you don't know that you have a, a price variation like that, you'll go, to, because you're, only, you know, you're being told your insurance is going to pay most of it, you'll pay 10%, so you figure 1700 is out of pocket, and you're not realizing that that is really obscene, uh, that there, you had other choices. So I always believe that the greatness of this country was based upon our ability to have choice. It is just so simple. I have choice. I'm not going to abuse it. Just, but I want to make an intelligent decision in regards to what I buy. And I want information to do that. And one day I hope that we see that. But, you know, the, there are countries that don't give you pricing information. But we didn't get, we got great because we were competitive. We allowed competition. Healthcare is a competitive field. And the people who practice it well and the people who offer a really good return on that, and it may not be cheap. I don't believe in sales, really don't, um, I don't or giveaways. I'm just too old for that. But I want to see that kind of transformation. I'd love to see that. 
if I saw that, and I saw the other features I was talking about, where we can do in neighborhoods and homes, better eating, epigenetic issues, uh, this would be, we would be a state that would be envied. And we would take our place as the state that's doing it so well in so many venues and so effectively that rather than have to follow Maine and New Hampshire, which pains me, because uh, I've had it when I was in the HUD, I had to visit both, so it pains me to be a follower. We're, we are a leader in this state. I mean, I'll be really blunt. I mean, who wakes up in the morning and says that it's great being in second place? I mean, who gets into a race and says, wow, wow, I'm going to work really hard to be second. Nobody wakes up to be second. We wake up to be first. This country woke up to be first. That's why we're the greatest country in the history of humankind, because we strove to be first. First, 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 first. If we had all the things we talk about, the transparency issues, the issues on the web page, the issues of how to select docs and drugs and all of that, if we had something that did that, we fixed our neighborhoods, got our schools, dealt with epigenetics, we would be in a league of our own and everybody would be trying to catch up. Just like Silicon Valley is still trying to catch up. Austin, Texas is still trying to call up. I go to Austin, Texas and they say, one day we'll be like Seattle. And I said, we're running too fast, you'll never be like Seattle. <laughs> Let's be first. Peace to you all. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. <laughs>